Recording in progress. We could be two adverts. Sorry. Can we hear feedback? Good. We should be good okay. now. All right. Check, double check the time. Six o'clock, we're on the air. And <clears throat> Zoom is up and recording, is that correct? Yes. Bang a rang. Good evening, everybody, and good evening, our friends out on the internet and um, uh, in, in town watching their televisions. This is the Monday, January 22nd, 2024, meeting of the Lunenburg Planning Board. This meeting is being recorded via Zoom, and it is being held at Town Hall. You may participate by using the Zoom link posted on the agenda, uh, either the link or the call-in number. You may also come on down to Town Hall. If you have any questions, please do reach out. We love public engagement. Uh, you have three members sitting up here tonight, as well as Ms. Reed is joining us remotely via Zoom as our fourth planning board member. I believe that's everything I am required to say. Thank you for joining us, and we begin, as always, with public comment. Seeing none. Um, before we dive into business, I did want, we'll address this more formally when the time comes. I did want to call out that 255 Sunny Hill Road has requested yet another continuance, uh, but they, I believe we are expecting to continue that to later than just our next meeting. Right. Uh, out to, do we have the date on that? February 26th. Out to February 26th, you said? Yes, 6th. 26th. So that will not be, that will be spaced out and we have um, set the expectation with them that we need to know by the 20th if they will be continuing, uh, requesting the continuance. So hopefully we don't have these day of last minute requests. Um, thank you for your patience with that. And we do have an item on the agenda that hopefully will alleviate some of this burden on interested members of the community who wish to come in. All right. That said, I will move us on to our agenda, and the first thing we have is the decision for 360 Flat Hill Road. That was a scenic, that was a scenic roads decision. And what is that? Just for us, to, just for us to sign, or do we have to add anything to it? We already voted. We already we voted. voted. Yep, right. just to sign. So let's just sign. So we can just sign after the meeting's over. Yep. Then super. So it's on there, so we don't forget. But don't need to do any business here tonight for it. Excellent. Love agenda items that go that quick. Next up, we have an ANR at Lemister Road and Kilburn Street. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. My name is Greg Roy with Dillson Roy, and I'm representing the applicant this evening, which is Timrick um, Realty Trust. <clears throat> and uh, we're here before you today for a three lot A&R plan um, on the corner. It's the, the property on the corner of Lemonster Road and Kilburn Street. <clears throat> um, it's a rather large parcel of land. I'm keenly aware that I've positioned the board too far away so that I can't read it. Uh, but there are two lots that are uh, that we're proposing to create on Lemonster Road uh, with frontage off of Lemonster Road. And then if you go around the corner onto Kilbourne Street, uh, Kilbourne Street, there's a, <clears throat> a third lot that we're proposing um, on, on, that, um, on that street. We spent 
actually several years with this applicant, uh, soil testing the property. Um, the property is quite large, but also has quite a lot of wetlands on it. And um, the soils are not um, super, <laughs> I guess I'll say, uh, for the purposes of uh, siting septic systems on the property. So we found three suitable areas for, for uh, septic systems um, on the property. Um, and that is why we, we created the lots in the, in the configuration that we did. All of the lots have sufficient frontage and area. They also comply with your uh, minimum required um, wetland percentage and lot shape requirements. I should, I should point out that the property is located within the residence B zoning district, so we have an 80,000 square foot um, uh, land area requirement. All of them are in excess of that. Um, they all have excess in excess of 90% of the upland area, so they all have an excess of 72,000 square feet of upland area on the property, which in effect meets your 10% uh, uh, wetland requirement. Uh, so some of them have more area of wetlands on the property, but we do meet the, uh, the, the, uh, the requirement in virtue of the fact that we're, we're providing that 90% of upland. Um, the only one I wanted to talk about, well, I want to hit on a few things. One is to just to tell you where we are with permitting um, for the rest of the, uh, the rest of the land use permits. We're before the Conservation Commission for all three lots. Um, there are um, the houses, septic, not septic system, but houses and grading um, require work within the 100 foot buffer zone. So we do have notice of intents for lots two and three and a uh, request for determination of applicability for lot one before the Conservation Commission. We expect that to, um, we've been waiting for DEP for quite some time to comment on those. We expect that to close uh, short. We, we expect to go back to the Conservation Commission um, the first meeting in February for that. Um, <clears throat> and then we also um, have submitted Board of Health uh, septic permits um, on all three of the lots as well. They have issued comments, which we've addressed. I am not sure if they have addressed, it, if they have uh, formally issued permits yet, but I believe that we are close to receiving uh, Board of Health permits for those lots. The only other thing I wanted to mention was on lot one, you can see a uh, access easement that traverses the property. That access easement is existing today. There's a driveway easement that, uh, that tra traverses and, and services, um, I think two houses actually um, off the property. So obviously we're preserving that easement access as we go through the new lot. Um, We've configured the driveway, house, and septic system locations on that lot to accommodate that easement uh, so that that access would be preserved. And I think that is all. Um, I will have to, have to take any questions or comments that you folks have. Um, that existing easement, it does not have a current driveway on it? Or it does. It does? Yes, it's okay. an existing driveway, yes. Okay. It's been there for a long time, yeah. yeah over, okay. over ten years, I would speculate. I don't have the exact, the exact uh, timeline. Are you envisioning using that driveway for the house as well? No. Okay. We are going to keep that completely separate. So let me try and explain that a little bit. Uh, have you considered pursuing a relocation of that easement so it doesn't divide well, the parcel? Well, I, I, uh, I, to be quite frank with you, I'm not sure. Um, because I wasn't the person that was interfacing directly with the client when we, when, we, uh, when we set that up. But we have accommodated a completely separate driveway for the proposed house, which is uh, further south, actually, on Lemonster Road. So south is planned right. Um, mm -hmm. okay. And so we, we have a, we're going to keep those driveways complete, completely okay. separate and distinct, is the plan. Okay. Um, you know, I, this is not super directly relevant to this, but this is more for my own edification. So when we do an ANR, and mm -hmm. I mean, it carves up property into smaller lots, mm -hmm. and there's an easement like that, how does that get processed with everything? And it just continues with, pro with the land. Okay. It, um, that's not a consideration of ANR endorsement. Uh, so that, that's why I try yeah. to be clear. This is not about the endorsement. Right. This is purely for my own. It, it yeah. just, yeah, it, just to it just, it just, it runs with the prop. It, presumably, it runs with the property. Presumably, they have an easement that's that long. 
Uh, sometimes what you'll see is property owners will talk to the folks who have the right to easement to relocate it so it doesn't divide the property in the middle. But in, in this case, because of the topography on the lot, there really isn't okay. another opportunity to relocate okay. the driveway in any in any yeah. more favorable location. And okay. uh, and that's exactly right. It, it's basically it's an existing encumbrance on the land now, mm -hmm. and it will remain when we when we create the new lot. It's, it's the same as if. Um, Ever source had a power line easement transmission line yep. run through property? It's there. Yep. Yeah, I always kind of assumed they just stayed, but I realized on the back end, I don't know how that's yeah. interpreted. All right. Yeah, the person that, owned, that has the benefit of the easement would have to relinquish it, basically. Okay. And you'd have to dissolve that through a legal process. And I don't want to get too far afield and outside of my subject matter of expertise, but if the person that has I mean, we, we run into situations like that where we have a, a a very, for lack of a better word, ancient access easement that is not being utilized and hasn't been for decades. Sometimes you can have a situation where you can get that extinguished through a legal process, but this is not one of them. This is an active uh, driveway, so. And, and, and sometimes the holder of it is, or beneficiary of it, right. is more than happy to have relocated, and sometimes they're just adamant they don't. Well, thank you. And, and just for the sake of clarity, again, I was asking for my own Understood. benefit of learning. Uh, we are limited in how we interpret these, as always. Um, before we go on, I have not. I just realized, uh, Ms. Ree, could you just chime in to make sure we can hear you this evening? I am here. Can you hear me? Thank you. Perfect. <clears throat> um, I'll turn to the board and ask what other questions we might have. I don't have any questions at this point. Um, now, you're creating three new lots out of it. Correct. What's the intent to do with the remaining big parcel? You know, I, I was asked that at conservation as well, and I'm not sure. I think at the, at the moment it will be retained by the family. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's, it's family-owned land. Um, there's, like I said, there's a lot of wetlands on there. And we've, it, you know, we, we've soil tested the areas that are greater than 100 feet from the wetland areas and they you know there's there's some shale and some mm -hmm. otherwise just not terrific soils out there so um there's no media plans that i know of okay for the, for the land so i have a question please um i'm not familiar with timrick um i'm not familiar with timrick realty trust but you, you say it's a family is it the family of the the Joshua T. Hillman, the Hillman's. abutting property? Yes, sir. Yeah, it is. So it's Judge, Judge Hillman is our uh, client. He's a former judge. And, uh, so the adjacent property has a 20-foot wide access strip to that huge parcel up behind it that's not shown. It's shown on your locust map. Um, so if this is commonly owned, I mean, I understand the difference between a family name and a, and a trust is different ownership, but if... Um, wouldn't there be an option for us to suggest that they increase this 20.29 foot frontage leg, which is um, pretty small for that? Which one is? Which so to to the to the northeast, I assume. So one of the. One of the two properties that served by the common driveway, there's a there's a leg that shows on your locus map that doesn't show on the plan itself. Okay. So the the four hundred four four thirty two point twenty four from Lemonster Road. There's there's two bounds shown, which I assume are, would be the frontage. At the bottom there of your plan. Over here. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. So there's two bounds shown there. Iron rods found. I see. Yeah. And it looks to me that that might be the frontage of that large lot that doesn't show anywhere aside from the locust plan. Yeah, well, you had your finger on it. I think that's it. Um, it's an existing nonconformance, apparently, because there's a lot line there. But if they're all under common ownership, there was a lot... There was a common lot merger. It merged for zoning, and you can't separate it then. Yeah, but I, I think 
So I'm not sure on this, but I think we would argue that they're not under common ownership. I mean, I'm not an attorney. But even if they were, um, our clients had not instructed us to. That parcel was not included in our scope of work. So if, you know, the, I guess they'd, they'd be at risk relative to that. If they, if there was a claim made that they were under common ownership, yes, they would be giving up some rights on that. But I don't believe, I believe that they were in. Well, I, I guess the answer to the question was when, <clears throat> when did Timmick Realty Trust become the owner of this 81 plus acres versus, uh, versus yeah. the Hillman family? I'm not sure. I guess, <clears throat> would, would that not be the, the answer to this question? That, yeah. that is the question, that is the answer as we're in Mont's merge is when did they take ownership of it? They took ownership of it two years ago. This issue, they took ownership of it 40 years ago. Right. It's not an issue. Exactly. I guess that's my question. Right. I, I just, I'm not, I don't have that answer. Okay. Um, I think that comes in more of a issue when you apply for your building permit. Yeah. In the building commissioner's determination of this, Buildable lot. Well, I just I just wanted to bring it up at this right. point, um, so that you had the opportunity, so that it, that question is on record. <coughs> excuse me, and you have the opportunity <coughs> to look at the option of. Um, Understood, I, and I I think that um, I mean I'll certainly bring that back to my team and my client through my team, um, but I think that. I could only assume that that's been vetted, either that it's been determined legally that it's a, it, that it, it does not meet the common ownership test, sure. or that they're just not intending to uh, carry that forward as a, as a, um, that separate lot with the 20 feet of frontage is a uh, performing lot. Does that lot have a house on it? That I don't know. I was just actually going to. Do you have the assessors in front of you? Oh, I don't, Mr. Ellison. I don't either. I, I actually think it might. It might because I think the driveway through lot one is shared. I believe. Well, I don't have the assessors map in front. The of The issue that raises is if it's got an existing house on it, and then if it did merge, and they separated it off. That house would probably lose any grandfathering rights. Yeah, you have an infectious invalidity clause. Yeah. Um, or argument. Um, I'm just not prepared to answer that yeah. tonight, mm -hmm. folks. No, no worries. I just don't know. Um, I think for purpose of endorsement A and R. Right. I just wanted to, have I, I wanted to make that so, known. No, That's I think all. so. And, right. and you know, if you endorse the plan. Um, it's still owned by Timrick. <laughs> I thought one's still owned by Timrick, so it's not that it, it would negate that. It just... Uh, it might be some that you take back, yeah. board endorses it, take back to your client. Yeah, and in most cases it becomes... If your client decides, yeah, that's an issue, yeah. then they right. ask the board, well, basically, we're not going to record the a &R Well, that's right. We and might, avoid it. Yeah, that would be the worst case scenario. So I think that... Yeah. Um, uh, great question. I, I don't. I wish I knew the. <laughs> I wish I was prepared no, for that answer. <laughs> um, but uh, but I think the risk is low at this point because it's not a uh, it's not a situation where it's we're, we're not conveying the property tonight. So yeah. mm -hmm. I think that um, they wouldn't. If if all of those conditions existed, that it would create an infectious invalidity um, issue. Yeah. Um, we you know um, we would we'll vet that before. The, the lot one would be very conveyed, good. So. Sorry to throw that wrench. No, no, no. I appreciate it because it, uh, it's, it's a. I'll, I'll bring it back to my team and the and the very good. to the client. And, and I'll tell you from my experience, I've known attorneys tell me that when I've raised it, oh, we didn't think about that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Some no, attorneys that's... think about, it, some don't. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, people hearing me talking and. and I'm no expert in infectious <laughs> invalidity, but just the sound of it makes you confused, <laughs> and uh, and that that's that's why because it's something you do that infects and makes something else invalid. So it's mm -hmm. sort of one of those 
backdoor type zoning issues that yeah and maybe that is actually what I was about to do is say mr. Harris for the benefit of the board <laughs> and not that again not that this impacts our decision with the a and R yeah but because this is a topic that's been brought up for the benefit of the board and for the benefit of the people in the audience and those viewing at home could you give a dime store explanation of infectious invalidity because that's what we've been talking about here basically you're create you're taking action make this legal but in doing so it's made this existing condition illegal yeah. great uh, and it re huge good example when it comes up is if somebody's got a house on they got a mortgage on it and they're carved off property mm. and then the mortgage holder says you just damn me you destroyed our collateral mm -hmm. We, we, the, first, the very first thing we advise the folks when they come, when they ask us to, to subdivide their property is, do you have a mortgage? If the answer is no, we're great. If the answer is yes, who's it with? And if it's Bank of America, we say refinance and then come back and see us because you're never going to get into the, you're never <laughs> and gonna I, get into I'd the say society. some of the biggest landers and forces in the country are the banks. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. Yep. So you know, there's a whole process. The bank has, is it subrogate? I think the bank has to subrogate or sub. I, again, I'm using legal words that I have no business using, but the <laughs> bank has to basically give up the, you know, has to make a decision and release that portion of the land before you do it. So anyway, we're getting far afield. But. Well, thank you for thank you for the education. I think uh, that's beat. valuable for all of us. <laughs> uh, I will turn to the board and say um, now, really focusing, we've uh, raised potential concerns that could exist to the applicant so they may do with that what they wish there is a house on it i'm sorry oh okay there is a house on it there we go oh there is okay well by the gis ma'am sorry no, that, that's sorry. that's a great uh mental note note made all right but uh for the purposes of endorsing the anr we're look now let's focus our conversation there um so now i would entertain any other questions or thoughts that lead us towards or away from or on the topic of endorsing are just to make sure i understood the conversation that was happening any of these things that we've discussed aren't necessarily going to impact the anr like that's that's the property holders like if something's missing there that's something that they're going to find out and have to deal it, with it doesn't affect your ability to endorse or not endorse right okay and yeah but as a board, we have a history of asking a few probing questions when something seems off in the hopes of trying to head off at the past future issues for the applicant. Sure. Um, really, and sometimes that puts people off because they look at it and go, but you can't consider this. And we have to say, well, we're not. But we thought you might want to know because we don't want you to put yourself in a bad situation. Let me rephrase my answer. It doesn't affect your responsibility to endorse or not endorse. Yes. Okay. There we go. Good wording. All right. So, uh, <coughs> hearing no other questions, um, and I don't have any, I, I see everything Mr. Roy has discussed, I would look for a motion. I, I do have one comment oh, to make. Please. I, I very much appreciate that you mentioned that all three septics are currently under review. Um, and I'll bring this up later in the board comment, but that's something that we're, uh, our, our ENR regulations require response from the Board of Health. Is that true or not? Um, yeah, and I do have a letter from the Board of Health. Okay, that but we didn't, we didn't ask for that letter before, but again, board comment, nothing to do with uh, this one. I don't. Thank you. I d do we require a response well, from the Board of Health or merely that they have submitted I, the request. I actually think they have to sign before we can even come to this meeting. Okay, so, so yeah. there we go. If we're here, it means that they've, they've they've given some indication that some that either something is an issue or it is an issue, and they've they've done soil testing and done and whatever. But we honestly, after 20 days of submittal to the board, you have no choice but take yeah. action even without the board of health. That's right. Yep. Actually, uh, 20 days. Yeah. All so, right. So the 21st so, day. It's 21st day I filed with the town clerk. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Again, I turn to us and I'd be looking for a motion. Sure. Uh, motion to endorse uh, the ANR for Lemonster Road and Kilburn Street. Second. 
Moved and seconded. Now I need to do a roll call vote because we have a member remote. Um, and Ms. Reed, I will generally be starting with you on these, just so you can anticipate that. Um, Ms. Reed. Aye. Mr. Wilsner. Aye. Mr. Aye. Allison. Aye. And an aye from myself. Very good. Thank you very much, Mr. Roy. We appreciate it. You bet. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm going to go back to our agenda, in theory. And next up would be um, modification to erosion control plan for 274 Prospect Street. How's it going? Tony Diacetis, a and Construction. Um, fairly simple. We're really just looking to change the location of the silt fence from the original plan. Um, the original location really isn't in the greatest spot. We have some um, standing water on the side of the road that's kind of preventing us from putting it where it was originally located, looking to move it farther up the property. All right. Um, and uh, I am just, I'm looking through our notes. Uh, um, the things I saw here, we have uh, I think it was your recommendation that this is a de minimis change. Yes. And yes. then we had uh, another response, I think, from the Conservation Commission. Yeah. The Conservation Administrator and Ked, she's supportive of the change as well. Yes. Okay. Yes. Basically, so sedimentation should be closest to the end of uh, limited construction as possible. Yeah. And the way it was originally approved, it was quite far away and downslope. Yeah. And that means you would have runoff going through vegetation maintaining before getting to the silt fence and that's right. not the way it's supposed to work. All right. We have um, uh, a uh, we have a recommendation from the conservation administrator and from our interim land use director and along with uh, your opinion that this would qualify as a de minimis change. Yes but it's not it's been requested as a de minimis change, so we don't have to find that it is de minimis and then vote on it? Is that correct? Well, if you, find, if you don't agree that's de, min de minimis, then you need to go through formal amendment process, public hearing, all that stuff. Should it have been advertised as a de minimis change, or does it matter? No. Okay. No. So, okay, so there was no in... So are we ready to make that? I mean, I, I, I'm I, happy with all the input we've gotten. I, I, I would move that we find this uh, to be a de minimis change for which this Prospect Street, which street, which number? Uh, 274, 274 Prospect. 274 Prospect Street. And Second. Approve, and approve the modification. Oh, we have to find it's de minimis first and then make the okay, vote, you don't we? You could just one motion or two, it's two, that's fine. Yeah. Oh, and, and I'll, I'll amend my motion to add that we approve this de minimis change. Does that work? Yeah. Yep. Move. Second. And seconded. All right. All in favor? Um, Ms. Reed? Aye. Mr. Wilsner? Aye. Mr. Allison? Aye. And an aye for myself. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. I love it when things are straightforward. Um, next up would be the public hearing continued for 255 Sunny Hill Road Stormwater Management Plan. As I mentioned earlier, um, they have requested a continuance due to technicality. Tech, I mean, if I don't think, I don't know if we need to get into all of it, but and we can certainly, but Basi technicality. Basically, they're, they're waiting for a um, permit number from MassDEP. And they're getting some pushback from SDP on project. Um, and that's due to the history of the history of the property that was divided, oh, 10, 15 years ago. Um, all right. And the request was to continue to 26. Was they that? requested a continuation. I talked to uh, Justin Leclerc and asked him when does he think he's going to be ready? Because I didn't see a reason to continue to the next meeting if you're not going to be ready. 
and so also we'd want information by a week before the meeting and in our discussion we agree that February 26 should be a reasonable date with them getting the information to us no later than February 20th I would say the 19th but 19th is a holiday so are you ready for a motion? I say I would love to uh, have a motion on this. I move that we continue the 255 Sunny Hill Road stormwater permit public hearing to February 26th at 6.05. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Ms. Reed? Aye. Mr. Wilsner? Aye. Mr. Allison? Aye. And an aye from myself. Um, for the interest, interested members of the public, because this has been continued several times, um, as was stated, we are expecting that they will let us know by the 20th if they reasonably believe that they will be able to move forward on the 26th. Now, if I can explain the rationale I gave for the 20th is if they give it to us on the 20th, they're going to ask for another continuation. They would give us time to post it on the website and possibly even somehow notify voters that it, they haven't made the request. That way, so, sorry. Was so if you don't show up here or online expecting to see a meeting, then it not happen. And as I said, we have an uh, uh, agenda item later to try to look at codifying this sort of process more thoroughly for the board so that we can avoid having people have to come out when they don't have to. All right. Uh, next up would be uh, the continued public hearing for 317 to 321 Sunny Hill Road Stormwater Management Plan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. My name is Greg Roy with Dillison Roy. And I am representing the applicant this evening, CTB Holdings. Uh, Tim Battles is here uh, representing uh, CTB Holdings this evening. And um, I wanted to give you a little bit of a background on this project. Uh, actually, Mr. Roy, I'm going to interrupt for a minute. I'm sorry. Uh, I just wanted to verify, we have opened this public hearing in the past, and this is a continuance. Is that correct? Or have we? Um, well. Um, no, I don't remember. We continued it on the opening hearing, so you may want to open it. Uh, if you didn't actually open the f on the first time, <coughs> you simply deferred it or continued. You need we, to we did. We, we asked you for a continuance. Very good. You then may not have opened it. So I am going to pause us. Okay. Um, Ms. Reed, I'm happy to read just because you are remote. <coughs> um, do I give the original date or do I give today's date? Or the date? Get the original date and then note in there that it was continued to today's date. Oh, okay. The Lunenburg Planning Board will hold a public hearing um, originally on January 8th, 2023 oh, at 6.05 p.m., but now has been continued to today, January 22nd, 2024 at 6.05 p.m at Town Hall, 17 Main Street, Lunenburg, MA, to hear and review the stormwater permit application under Chapter 204 of the Code of the Town of Lunenburg for 317 to 320 Will, 21 Sunny Hill Road. Um, applicant and owner Tim Battles, 33 Lo Lomar Park Drive, Pepperell. MA 01463. Materials are available for viewing at the Planning Office, 960 Massachusetts Ave, Lunenburg, MA, MA. This meeting is broadcast live through local access cable on Facebook Live and on public access. Uh, on the public access Facebook page. And I don't believe we have to keep going with every detail of how it's being. It's fine. Yeah. Broadcast. So now that we're We've definitely opened the hearing, and there can be <laughs> yes. no question. Thank you for your patience, Mr. Roy. Thank you very much. Greg Roy, Dilson Roy, representing the applicant, CTB Holdings. Uh, Tim Battles is here um, uh, with us this evening as well. Um, as you mentioned, the property is located on Sunny Hill Road at address 317 and 321. And I wanted to give you a, a little bit of a history lesson on this um, and then get into the merits of the project and try to be as brief as I can. The, uh, the applicant purchased the property, I think, um, 
over two years ago, retained our firm a little bit over two years ago to um, finish up the permitting relative to some, some additional soil testing that was required on the property and to take it through uh, the required um, uh, septic system permits uh, and the like and, and to administer construction services. Um, sometime in April of 2022, uh, or sometime around April of 2022, the applicant, we had, um, we had received Board of Health permits uh, for, the, for the two pieces of property. And the applicant applied for and received the building permit on 321, which is the, the one on the um, lower portion of the plan, um, on the, the upper uh, uphill, if you will, um, the, the higher of the two lots, and, uh, and has since uh, constructed the uh, septic system house driveway um, and the site improvements um, at the site um, a few months ago, they um, applied, the applicant applied for a certificate of occupancy, and uh, it was determined at that time that a stormwater permit was required. So <laughs> I wanted to get that in the record. We are here uh, to, clean that, to, to clean that process up. Um, I think at the time, the, um, the construction of 321 did not constitute an acre of disturbance, um, as shown on our septic plan. It was, it was something less than 30,000 square feet of, of disturbance. Um, <clears throat> what ended up happening on the site was that um, some additional land was cleared uh, down to the bottom of the hill, um, and it was also cleared onto uh, 317, uh, which was the other lot that was not the subject of the building permit. So as you read through your stormwater regulations, um, land clearing um, in excess of, not just land disturbance, but land clearing in excess of an acre requires a stormwater permit. So um, it was one of those things that uh, I think just in virtue of the timing of, of how things went down relative to uh, permitting um, just fell through the cracks. So we are here uh, this evening to uh, make good on that, uh, on that issue. So the, the applicant uh, a month or two ago hired us to, um, to prepare the stormwater permit that's in front of you and we have included uh, both of the lots in this in this stormwater permit because they uh, they are owned uh, both by the applicant at this point <clears throat> and together represent about 115,000 square feet of disturbed area uh, so what we submitted to you was in addition to this plan we also submitted to you a detailed uh, stormwater uh, report documenting compliance with your regulations the Massachusetts stormwater and the Massachusetts stormwater management regulations uh, as well as the various various project narratives and applications that you require as part of that process. Um, and um, I'll just give you a quick tutorial of the plan. The light green area is the portion of the, of the, um, of the work area that has been disturbed and cleared. And um, you can see that the location of the two houses um, up uh, closer to Sunny Hill Road the one on the, the lower side of the plan has been installed in the driveway as well as the septic system. So that, that work has been complete. The property on the uh, northerly side of the plan uphill, uh, that driveway house and septic system has not been constructed at this point. But the area within the light green has been, has been cleared. Um, the toe of the uh, slope, if you will, uh, limit of work area um, for 321 on the southerly side of the plan is actually upgrading of where we're proposing our stormwater uh, feature. So I'm going to go over and point. Right in here. I tried to find my laser pointer before I got here and I, I couldn't find it. So currently today, that's the limit of the soil disturbance at the, at the site. Um, the, the, the rest of the area was cleared, but it was not grubbed. So from a soil disturbance standpoint, it wasn't, it wasn't disturbed. It was, it was left um, with roots and, and things in, intact. Um, we identified um, a few things that needed to be done on the site, um, both on the existing site and on the pro in addition to the proposed site that would bring the, bring the uh, project into compliance with your stormwater regulations. The first would be to put um, a, 
uh, we're, we're, we're proposing to do a, um, a stormwater rain garden down at the toe of the slope. In this case, um, it's, it's, a, it's a rather significant slope, as I'm sure you're all aware of Sunny Hill Road. And so one of the positive parts of that is you have the opportunity to collect all of the runoff if you put a feature down at the, at the toe of the slope. And that's what we're proposing to do. Uh, so we're putting a series of water quality swales uh, right at the toe of that slope in a, uh, in a rain garden um, to treat and attenuate peak, peak runoff rates from the, from the developed area um, on the uh, on, uh, upgrading where the house driveway and septic system are. That's for 321. On 317, which again has not been constructed yet, we've also designed a similar um, rain garden feature on the lower side of the lot with a, with a swale that captures all of that runoff as it runs down the hill and collects it before it, uh, before it uh, flows uh, downhill. Uh, but on that one, we've also included a, um, a stone recharge trench on the edge of the driveway. And again, this is the one that hasn't been constructed, um, which will act to collect stormwater and recharge it at the, you know, at the point um, where it runs off the, the driveway pavement. Um, all of those things, um, combi all of those features combined uh, lead us to compliance with the stormwater uh, requirements for peak rate of runoff, uh, TSS removal, uh, recharge calculations and the like. Um, we did receive a peer review comment letter from Graves Engineering. Uh, you, you folks uh, sent that out uh, for peer review. That came in today. So I'm going to summarize that uh, really briefly. It was um, a nine point letter. <clears throat> Five of the comments were really not substantive. Um, four comments um, and I'll, I'll summarize them for, for your board and also for the members of the, of the audience that maybe have interest. Um, the first comment was that we need to add the applicant's telephone number and address, um, the, owner's app, the owner and applicant's telephone numbers to the plans. That's certainly not an issue. Um, the second substantive comment was to uh, perform soil testing within the rain gardens and, uh, and BMP areas. We actually have performed soil testing down there. We just failed to, to give those logs to uh, put them on the plan and give them to, to uh, Mr. Walsh, uh, Graves Engineering, so we will do that. Um, uh, <clears throat> the plan, and then third, the plan should be, uh, should include this, the site zoning information, so that's, that's not a problem at all. Um, and then fourth, the, in our hydraulic model uh, for our um, the stone recharge trench that I described earlier for the 317 driveway, we modeled that a little bit uh, with, with uh, an incorrect void volume in the stone, uh, which we will which we'll clean up. Other than that, he had no issues with the way we handled the stormwater on the site um, and no other, uh, no other substantive comments. So I wanted to give you that history and summary and then stop and ask for any questions or comments that you folks may have or any, uh, of course, any comments from the public. All right, um, I will turn to members of the board first for any questions we have. Again, the, we got the, um, if you've not yet had the opportunity to review it, uh, we did get the response from Graves Engineering today. And I would personally say, I, I think Mr. Roy, because it's very brief, did very adequately sure. explain the concerns there. Um, my only issue, and this isn't related to the thing, um, it just, I didn't receive any, when did we receive any documentation that we should have had here? Because I can't find anything here or in the January 8th files. The, I did, um, I did put the, uh, PDFs in okay. the drive and then for some reason I just checked and then so I put them in again. <laughs> okay, all right, <laughs> wonderful. Okay. Um, other than that, I didn't have any questions at this point. All right, uh, Mr. Allison or Ms. Reed. Ms. Reed, uh, just feel free to, if we're all talking, just throw up the hand signal. Otherwise, you know, interrupt. And Mr. Allison as well, do you have any questions at this time? Um, <clears throat> I don't. My, my one question, my question had been covered by Mr. Wilsmer about plans that we had available to us. Um, and 
I think it would be prudent for us to already assume that we're going to continue because we don't have the updated responses for plans uh, to the Graves review. Um, other than that, I, I mean, I, I appreciate you know the due diligence as soon as you were told that you set up this this hearing of, of this yeah, permit. Believe me, the, the the applicant would have been here two years ago. We uh, the applicant had a. A sale on the property that fell through this fall so we, we we would have been here two years ago so we want the board to know that I do have one question though uh, are there any wetland uh, <clears throat> features or resource areas at all within the light green area there are not no buffer zone or anything the, yeah they're yeah. well into the dark green area all right um, my, my my existing questions have also been addressed I see um, and I, I agree that I, I presume we'd be continuing because we still need to get those. I presume that too. I didn't want to speak for you, but I, I, I figured I, you would want to do that. Yeah, I think I think we you yeah. walked in we're all on the same page because yeah, right. yeah. I understood. But I did want to if there were any comments or questions, I wanted to capture everything so that we could come in with a complete package, say the beginning of next week, so that you guys are ready. Great. And that was I was <clears throat> going to ask. Uh, so in terms of continuing this. Uh, would our next meeting work for you? Um, oh. I have one question. Please. First, because I think you overstated. I know there are only two substantive comments from Graves. The zoning issue wasn't substantive. It's well, <laughs> yeah. what I meant by substantive was it requires action on my part. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the other ones were to say that there was One of the issues with this is, is there was an issue with the driveway gradient yeah. being yeah. too steep, yeah. and that's before the ZBA. Yes. That's true. Which, if the ZBA doesn't grant the relief, then the driveway has to be redone. That's true. Um, how would that impact the storm drainage? Uh, I mean, maybe slightly. If it did, we may have, may have to come back and, and do an amended process for this for this hearing. Um, <clears throat> but we've, like I said, we designed a feature that's down at the bottom of the slope that's capturing everything that's running down. So it really doesn't matter exactly how that driveway is orientated if we have to reconstruct that. So um, my suggestion would be, <clears throat> given that the ZBA is scheduled to meet February 14th, if it wouldn't be more practical to... 14th? Yeah. yeah okay. It wouldn't be more practical to continue the hearing to February 26th at the ZBA acts. So then we'll know... You, your next hearing is when? No. Well, I know, but I'm just asking, when is your next, your next hearing? February 12th. February 12th. Yeah. Uh-huh. So just go to the 26th, and that way we know what ZBA has done by then. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> um, it will save you from having to come back if no, don't I, get. I understand. Yeah. I have oh. uh, I, I would ask you just to come up uh, and just for the sake of completeness, completeness give your name and address. My name is Tim Battles. My address is actually 47 Hawthorne Village Road. Um, it was uh, located at 33 Lomar Park, but has since moved. Um, my only concern is I do have a buyer that wants to close by the end of next month. Um, so I was hoping to kind of have some answers, more definitive answers for them um, by the end of next month. Well, so, I'll put and I totally way. understand your position on the this. The stormwater permit doesn't have an, an appeal period. Therefore, the board approves it to 26. You're done. Um, if you, the board acted before the ZBA. I, agree, I understand. Yeah. yeah. I'm just letting you know. No. From my, yeah. So it's been a long process. This is, I mean, it sounds like this is really just a decision for the applicant. They could go for the they could go for the approval at our next meeting if it gets approved and zba doesn't grant the driveway then you'd have to come back and deal with all of that but if it does work and if, it this, if the zba doesn't grant the uh the relief then you would have about a week to get revised plan to us that the board could then act on on the 26th true but at that if the sooner I have an idea of what's going to happen, um, you know, then I can at least deal with my... Well, the reality is you will not know until the 14th or the earliest in ZBA acts. Right. Yep. So can we go into this... Well, can I go into the assumption? I know that's dangerous, but if, the, if it is a favorable ruling by the ZBA, is it safe to assume that, provided um, Greg answers all 
the questions I, on this that I don't there's any doubt that it would if the peer review is satisfied with the drainage that the board would be I, I I do not anticipate yeah. always watching my wording I, it, I do not anticipate that would be an issue right but I'm speaking as one member of a multi-member board and I'm not going to have us chime in about expected votes and the yeah, totally well, totally yeah. appreciate that but no I mean you are welcome to move forward and continue to our next meeting and assuming we approve it and assuming ZBA grants the exception be good to go Great. it would be more of a logistical headache if we grant it and then, have and to then ZBA and does not but this is your call and in fact just if the oh, board granted on the 12th on. ZBA said fine. no you wouldn't have decision by in in the favor right so continue is fine then yeah to the 26 yeah yeah I think that's prudent because thank you we we would then avoid having to re-advertise right. so thank, thanks and yeah, that that was my concern about no no I appreciate that I uh, I mean we we as the applicant says we, we certainly always want to move as fast as we can but we don't want to shoot ourselves in the foot so well, appreciate I, have, that. I have another option but I'm pretty sure it's not actually an option so I, I just want to ask if it is I my understanding is that we can't make an approval contingent upon another group's approval no. is there a way that we could approve the stormwater permit conditional upon the ZBA granting that relief not ready now no okay no. I, I tried. That's too bad. We, we that need them both, right? We need them both, so it doesn't. They're, they're and sort of typically, I always advise people get your ZBA relief before you get anybody else's relief. Well, we, we were hoping to, but I think that just took a little longer to yep. get on the meeting than we hoped. So that's the way it goes. So you'd be, uh, you, you would request a continuance to uh, the 26th. Is that correct? Right? Okay. We I would, just want to make we'll, sure. We'll Great. say that out loud. We'd, we'd like to formally request. A continuous to this meeting till the 26th wonderful all right um, I would be I, I did, I did oh. want to make sure is there a member of the public I was, say, I, I was about to say that what we haven't done is turn to the public and I apologize because I'd, I'd love to hear it if there is one um, so I do want to make sure we're overt about public comment if any members of the public wish to speak all right seeing none um, all right now then i would be we can just move to continue correct mm -hmm. from here we don't need yes. to do anything else okay great so i'd be looking for a motion to continue the public hearing for 317 to 320 will one sunny hill road to um a date certain of february 26th at 605 p.m so moved seconded <clears throat> Moved and seconded. All in favor? <coughs> Ms. Reed? Aye. Mr. Wilsner? Aye. Mr. Allison? Aye. And an aye from myself. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's your fault. I always say an eye from myself, which is your tagline, but I apparently just say the same thing now. So there we go. What? Uh, when voting, you always end with an I from myself when you were chair. Well, that's, well, I could just say I, but I'm not sure about the propriety of the English. I, I don't know. So I just, I, re I say the, ex I say the <laughs> exact same way you did. Perfect. Word for word. There take, we go. I take a lot of cues from other boards, too. Um, I'm going to go back to the agenda. And... Great. So that is the end of our public hearings. <coughs> Looks like we're uh, going to be lacking some public in the room. But friends, if you're watching at home, you can always join the Zoom meeting and attend this fantastic public service party online. Um, Woohoo! <laughs> raise the roof, but not too high. It could damage the clock. Um, board policy changes. Timeline, and I, I wanted this put on the agenda. Timeline and expectations for continuing public hearings. Um, so we, we've had the um, issues a strong term, but I, uh, we've had a recent applicant who has come before us repeatedly and just kind of last minute saying, oh, no, not yet. A couple, yeah, we have had a couple. You're right. Um, and that's hard for members of the public and I know um, 
I was hoping we were going to get the wording, uh, the, the wording into the uh, into our drives for this time because you had sent me some at one point, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, that didn't happen, and I believe that's me. But um, I want to know what we felt about a policy change to put out the expectation that applicants before the board, when risk has, if they're going to before the meeting request a continuance that they would do so a week before the meeting sure. because that would be the, or even if you're not going to do anything show up and be ready to answer questions from the public hmm. um, with the expectation that people come to hear and interact yeah and I don't think it's fun uh, not fun it's not fair for people to take many Monday nights out just to be told, oh, not yet. Again, I'm not claiming this was a malicious decision. I think it's often just a matter of convenience of going, uh-oh, we can't X yet. Let's let them know. But it's, I view it as my job as a chair and our job as a board to safeguard that public engagement. Um, you may or may not share that feeling. But I turn to the board and say, how do we feel about that? And then we can get wording for the, because we do have to have exact wording for a policy right. change. Sure. But how do we feel about that? So we could then at our next meeting vote on wording. I do agree that like our, uh, a lot of our responsibility here is, is to the public. And as a result, like it should be a space where they know what they're getting and, and when they come to interact uh, with the town. Um, it seems complicated to try and make something to force people to show up uh, when they're, they're not like, sorry, the businesses that are looking to develop. Um, I'm curious to see how we would in, enforce um, the either like tell us a week before or the or else. Um, but, you know, anything we can do to, to move in that direction, I'm behind. Can I throw up my... Yeah, please. Um, typically, a applicant pays engineers and architects and attorneys some significant funds to show up at public meetings. If they're not going to be ready for it, they will sometimes submit a uh, last-minute yeah. request for continuation with the expectation that nobody has to show up. What I've done before is we required, one, any additional material was, is due no later than a week before the meeting. So they don't show up at last minute with new materials. And two, if they don't request a continuation within a certain period of time, they had to show up at the meeting, request at the meeting, but be prepared to go through the full public hearing. Sure. Which means if they're paying an engineer, architect, and attorney, yeah. they need to have the entire team there at the hearing. To, that, the cost of that tends to discourage people from doing sure. these last minute things. What happens if they don't show up, though? Then what do we do about it there? And like, what do we do about it going so, <laughs> forward? So here's the thought. The, app, the burdens on the applicant to demonstrate that they've met the standards for approval. Okay. There's information that hasn't been provided yet. Hmm. That's the reason for the continuation. They don't show up at the meeting. The board could close the hearing, make decision based on the information available. Okay. Which means a denial in most cases. Gotcha. Okay, so we, we do have that capability to say you didn't show up. You No, know, you didn't provide the information required. Oh, yes, yes. And therefore, the board had to act on what information had. And information had did not demonstrate compliance with the standards for approval. Sure. Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, that's the approach. And this, uh, I haven't had a problem with people Making sure they sure. made may the uh, uh, time frames. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
And so, I will tell you, some boards are not as willing to deny as other boards are. Sure. That's, that's usually the big challenge is will you actually make the motion to deny and sure. deny. At, at a certain point, like the ones that we've been continuing for like three months now, like it, it, it's circumstantial, I suppose. But yeah. uh, there's one tonight that I think they would have a legitimate argument. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're before conservation. They can't act because DEP sure. won't I issue <coughs> a permit number and DEP has raised the issue that I find perplexing, but yeah. Sure. But um, now, and if we did review the information as presented mm -hmm. and it was not sufficient for compliance and so we uh, voted to not approve. Right. Then they can still re they can begin the whole process anew. Or they can appeal your denial. Fair. Uh, and the most important expense to most developers is time. Sure. Consequently, if they have gone through a two month process and result in a denial, and the only way they can start is either appeal in court, which is very expensive, sure. or start the process over, which means possibly another two or three months. Yeah. Very few developers want to say we're, we're going to we're going to add three months to our time frame. Uh, now, if we did move forward with this, um, Ms. Aubrey, I, I turn to you just because I think we would want to be extremely proactive in our communication with applicants about this change for the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. um, now, that isn't wording that has to be finalized here in the meeting for whatever paperwork we give them to help them out, to my understanding. But I would say that that is something we'd want to make sure we address thoroughly and probably make part of our standard initial communication as well as reaching out to anyone with public hearings in the pipeline mm -hmm. and get confirmation that they understand that. Uh, does that make sense to you, Richard? I or? think what you'd want to do is have a very clear policy written and approved by the board, mm -hmm. post on the website, and attached to uh, uh, application instructions. Yeah. I do know, like, for instance, when we set up, um, if people are setting up like a tri-party account, I have a memorandum of understanding that applicants sign, and it basically is just an understanding of how that system works. And I don't know if it's something that necessarily needs to be uh, signed by an applicant, but I could definitely uh, put it into practice for before submitting a public hearing notice. It's kind of I do things like all at once of like the notice and then sending it to a butters. Um, I can definitely have that memorandum kind of handy. You know, what I would suggest is once the board adopts the policy, it become an acknowledgement attached to application mm -hmm. yeah. and that Applicants simply sign the acknowledgement that they're so they're, so they're aware of it, yeah. and that that's the best way of making sure they're that we have some saying yeah I'm aware of it and yeah I will make sure that we satisfy the requirements of getting everything to the board a week ahead of time and now I have heard from three of I've heard from uh, four of us at this meeting. Uh, I have not yet heard from Ms. Reed, who is at home, or Mr. Allison, who has had some quizzical looks upon his face. My, my biggest concern was enforceability. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it, it sounds like it, it's, it's enforceable to the point that the members of the body at that time feel that they're comfortable saying that, well, you didn't show up, you didn't follow the rules, we're going to close your public hearing. Mm -hmm. And I'm so if, if that's 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 basically the enforcement. There's no oh. there's no enforcement beyond that. Well, it, it's again, you failed to document and demonstrate that you met our standards for approval, and therefore mm -hmm. uh, we're, we had to close the hearing based upon what's available to us now because you did not 
adequately uh, represent yourself at the public hearing because you weren't there. Okay. Yeah. And they were given clear notice of it. I honestly don't think you're going to have a problem with people not getting stuff to you on time. But no, I, th I think we communicated clearly. It was a clear expectation. Yeah. Ms. Reed, do you have any any thoughts or questions you'd like to contribute? Um, I just had a couple of thoughts. Um, I think it's a good idea to have something like this in place. Um, I feel terrible for members of the public who show up meeting after meeting um, and the applicants or their representatives are not at the meeting. Um, that's not fair to them. Um, it's not really fair to the board or even admin because everything's kind of, you know, last minute and things have to change and we have to keep track of everything. Um, I don't think it's something, obviously, that's applicable to anything currently open, but I think going forward, um, it might set some kind of a precedent in the future to where um, there's better lines of communication between applicant and applicant representatives and the board. And I, I, I think it's a good step. I'm not, you know, quite sure of enforceability of it, but um, yeah, I, I'd be happy with um, everything that Mr. Harris presented. All right, so I hear conceptual broad approval of, from the board. So what I will do is I will take uh, the wording Mr. Harris said, work on that if it needs any work, and then get it out to us before the next meeting. And we'll have this um, board policy changes on the next meeting's agenda so we can review it. And we don't need any extra notice for policy changes. So then if we, if we like what we have and or edit it during the meeting to be something we like, then we could vote it in. And if we're not happy yet, we can workshop it as needed. Does that sound good? Yeah, I'm happy with that. It does, and but so now that we're talking about it, it gets me thinking about other things. Um, you know, having, having a project proposal uh, concurrently before multiple boards is a benefit to the applicant, no doubt. Um, but in past experiences, I've felt that it's somewhat detrimental to the town itself, to the different various boards, and especially now that we are at such a lack of staff um, and, and overview and oversight and, and, and whatnot, um, I'm wondering if we could, while we're talking about public hearing uh, policies for the planning board, uh, if if we've got a stormwater review that also has to be approved by zoning board of appeals and also has to go through conservation and then also needs something else from the board of health i'm wondering if 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 all these other regulatories couldn't be addressed at least partially or mostly or completely before it comes to planning board because, and, and I'll tell you, my caveat here is because I have watched multiple meetings where an applicant has gone before another board saying, oh, well, planning board didn't have a problem with it. Well, planning board was under time constraints for the most part, typically, to make a decision. And, um, and I don't think that that's fair to the other boards, commissions, committees, groups, whatnot, uh, or to us, quite honestly to be setting a precedent by saying, okay, you can do it, and then, oh, no, you can't, or we didn't want it done that way. Um, where you have time constraints on the planning board, sometimes you don't have a choice. Right. Um, but, for instance, special permits, you, you're you in the uh, controlling seat there because you can continue the hearing as long as there's insufficient information and not at just asking for this request here. It's going to be substantive. Usually it's beneficial to the town and to the boards to have uh, uh, concurrent reviews so if, if there's sufficient communication at the staff level to make sure that, 
Oh, yeah, they change the plans when the planning board. Exactly. And make sure the Conservation Commission got that information. And I think with Brian uh, as building commissioner, it, that, that's that been very helpful. Mm -hmm. and I think he's very good at almost uh, working as a uh, ringmaster with that because everybody finds out which projects are pending you know, our comments people are making. Um, I which, which, by the way, is above and beyond his job description right. currently. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would just want to mention that. Yeah. And Thank I'd, you for that, Brian. Yeah, Brian has been in, uh, an asset to the town, but I'm going to say an asset to this board in particular. Yeah. I, I really want to call that out. No so right. I, would not do, I would not discourage concurrent reviews, um, but to the extent that the planning board has flexibility of being the last one in line, you hold yourself as the last one in line. And I've done that a number of times where I've had Conservation Commission reviewing the project or a planning board reviewing the project, and I make sure that the planning board didn't close their hearing to Conservation Commission had. I guess, I guess that's where I was going with that, is can we put that in our standard procedures that when we have... To the, extent, to the extent that you have flexibility in the state law. Uh, the, the problem you have is like Definitive Subject Plan. Right. You don't have any... Cons well, it's, it's addressed within the, the regulations yeah. for How stuff like that. Is this something that needs to be addressed by formal policy, or is this something that can be addressed by the way we run the meetings? My question to that is what do we do if it's something that like we do have a time deadline but we are still also waiting for conservation commission or somebody else to do a review like if it is formally in here does that enable us to say we understand there's a time limit but other reviews have not been finished we're not capable under state law for instance if there's been a preliminary plan yeah. on subdivision and they come in with definitive you have 90 days from submittal the definitive to act on it make decision yeah that that doesn't go away just because conservation's sure delay. however oftentimes when you get into the nitty-gritty of the subject regulations the issues that conservation commission is dealing with usually leads to a failure to meet the subdivision requirements sure if conservation hasn't resolved it yet because for instance your stormwater has to be located, and you're doing work within the uh, uh, conservation zone that has been permitted. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to approve it conditioned upon it being approved as submitted. Yeah. Well, I'm an applicant. I'm saying, well, we know conservation is going to change it. Yeah. I don't want that condition. Okay, fine. Give us a letter continuing the hearing and extend the deadline. Didn't we just determine we can't condition it upon another group's approval? No. You're not doing that. What you're doing is you're saying, we want conservation to answer before we make decision. Therefore, we want the applicant to ask for a continuation and give us an extension of the deadline. Just like doing 171 Arbor Street okay, before they withdrew. Right. That they extend the deadline. That was my right. So as long as the applicant extends the extends deadline, extends deadline at, with the time clock stops. Yeah. with agreement okay. with the planning board. Right. It's got to be in agreement with the planning board. It can't just be one party. It's, it's supposed to be written, isn't it? Yes, it has to be in writing. Uh, planning board has to approve, it and it has to be filed with the town clerk. And that way, the public is given notice that there's been extension of the deadline. As long as that occurs, you're fine. And usually when you find that another board, whether it's a stormwater board, board or whether it's Conservation Commission or Board of Health, usually they're not, they haven't acted on it yet. It usually comes back to issue that's going to be in the subdivision, subdivision plan that the applicant doesn't want approved as submitted to the planning board because it means they're going to come back to the planning board to amend the plan. Sure. And okay. as I said earlier, time is the most, most expensive element they have. And if we're all of a sudden saying, oh, shoot, we're going to go back with not another 90-day 
process the, and plus another application fee plus another public hearing fee two weeks for the advertisement yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay but I do think that is a I can not say that's a formal policy as much as just how you function okay can we so, put that into the application similar to what we were I talking think about? we can put something in the plan was rules and regulations which if you don't have any we need to draw some up uh, there should be general rules and regulate rules and policies sure we don't I'm I not sure we do I think I, we do but, yeah, and it should be something in there about that okay all right so it sounds like we have a little bit of homework looking into that um, as well as some kind of concrete next steps on the uh, uh, expectations for how public hearings will continuances will be requested ahead of time sure. yeah. all right great I like the intention I like like I, I like the idea it's good great wonderful looking uh, board discussions we have nothing on the docket no minutes approval at this time committee reports master plan steering committee um, we haven't had anything major since last meeting. Next meeting's two Thursdays out. Um, mostly, we I think at the next meeting we are expecting all of the stage two surveys to be done, and then the next upcoming meeting that I don't think I wrote down, um, we'll be going over that and we'll do another public meeting. Um, Oh, sorry, no, uh, the public meeting is actually February 1st, so that's coming up rather quickly. Um, that will be, I believe it'll be at Eagle House. Yes, it is. Uh, and it is two separate meetings, one from 4 to 6 and one from 6.30 to 8.30. They're the same meeting. We just wanted to be more considerate of people's time. Um, and that's about it for the moment. Um, I'm just... February 1st doesn't sound right to me, but I think it is, and I'm wrong. I'm just double looking quickly. It's 100% February 1st. Yep. There will be two public meetings that day at different times. Yes. Um, the first, at, I think it's, I'd have to double check, I think at 4.30, but. Uh, I have 4 to 6 and 6.30 to 8.30. That's it. Thank you. Uh, that way, members of the community who have earlier bedtimes or later availability either way can make it to the meeting and just to further emphasize they are the same meeting just at different times yes, yes. Um, great open space ad hoc committee so we met on um, it was last week I think um, and the group well it was a while ago the group just um, decided to uh, support I guess um, the transfer of two pieces of Lake Shirley property to the parks from the select board general municipal to the parks commission uh, one was stump cove another one was Parmenter Road um, I watched the select board hearing on that or meeting and they had the hearing um, there was a lot of good good questions and comments brought up um, as far as uh, ownership of land versus who can do what versus who can come up with plans and propose things and um, it didn't seem like a necessity but it does seem like it may be something that could be on the warrant I'm not sure um, but again it was two parcels of land the three plus acre stump cove and a very small pie-shaped piece of land on Parmenter Road. Um, and that's about the extent of the open space uh, currently. Uh, Lundenberg Municipal Building Design Committee Thank you. has not met recently. Um, I did catch uh, a comment by the chair of the select board who was also a member of the Building Design Committee, um, possibly having something for the spring, but most likely not, maybe for the fall. All right. Um, thank you. I do know that our our, our uh, friends at Over Under and his associates, and I 
I can never remember all three groups that were contracted with at once, but we always say over under, but it's a, it's a trifecta. Right. Um, with, uh, I know that they're looking to hopefully meet, I don't know if it's with the whole committee or just with the chair, but they're looking to have some input there as well because that's information that seems worth sharing for their report. And one of the group, one of the firms is Ennis Design. Design, yeah. And the, my apologies, I always forget one of you. That is, it's different every time. Um, all right. Agricultural Commission. Uh, it's me again. Um, so we had our meeting last Thursday. Um, we are, we, we had a small discussion about goals. I, I neglected to have that on the agenda, so we didn't actually formalize any goals, but we will be doing that at our next meeting. Um, speaking of our next meeting, our next meeting will be the 15th, February 15th. And at that meeting, seven o'clock in the Ritter building, um, we are going to be brainstorming with any brain that wants to show up, any brain that wants to have input can submit it uh, by writing to me or to Farmers Market at LunarburgMass.gov or to any of the other four members or two alternates. I would recommend not the alternates because they haven't been showing up very often, but um, if anybody has any input they would like to add, comment, or otherwise about the Farmers Market for the upcoming season, we would be more than happy to hear it. Um, we are also actively looking for two or more individuals to help uh, promote and coordinate the market as manager. Um, we last year did not have, last year at the beginning of the year, well at the end of the year they made it known that they weren't going to continue. So we had a market management team of two members, uh, two people, uh, I'm sorry, that were not members. Um, managing the farmers market and last year it was managed by members of the Agricultural Commission and uh, it did, didn't come out as well as we had hoped and we again are looking for two or more people potentially uh, at least one person to stand up uh, and, and volunteer to help coordinate uh, the vendors and um, the, the market itself um, I, I will continue to be there every Sunday for the um, operation of the market. Um, but again, we, we're looking for a management team. And uh, February 15th at 7 o'clock Thursday at the Ritter building, tip probably downstairs, um, we would like to have as many people as would like to show up to comment, discuss, input, question, anything you'd like to bring up about the farmer's market. Um, you know, what day, what time, if, if you want to have it every Sunday, if you want to start it later in the season. Last year, I think we had 20-something Sundays. Um, again, we are open and curious to see if anybody has any input. So that was a long-winded committee report, but I had to stump for my group. Please do. Thank you. Uh, Capital Planning Committee. The Capital Planning Committee has not met. Um, the town manager has sent her draft of the anticipated, um, uh, of the recommended capital plan projects that does align uh, the, the, top, the top 10 that are expected to be funded do align with the board's recommend, with, with the Capital Planning Committee's rather recommendation, though the priority order is slightly different. Um, for those who don't know, the Capital Planning Committee, uh, through various means, ranks the capital plan requests, sends them to the town manager, then the town manager does have the right to edit that list as she deems appropriate as well. Um, more funding may become available as budgets settle out and maybe more projects will get funded. Um, but that's all happening and again a bit later in the winter early spring we will then be meeting again to look at actual capital planning not just capital ranking if, if I may add to, are you finished with that one uh, yes can I add to that please I, I watched a select board meeting uh, Tuesday 
um, and it was discussed. There were there were three the, out of the top ten. There were three that the town manager ranked differently than the committee. Yep. Um, and in addition, something that came up at the select board meeting um, was the forecast, the ten-year look look ahead mm -hmm. um, for the requests that were submitted. There were almost forty million dollars in capital requests for the next ten years, mm -hmm. and damn near twenty of them were the TC Passios and Turkey Hill. Yes, twenty million dollars in the next ten years. For building maintenance of, of these, I can shed if you'd like. I can shed a little more light on some of that. Well, no, I, I don't think it's well in board. Sure, of course. Uh, so, the Turkey Hill requests are interesting, and the reason, uh, uh, Mr. Beardmore on the school committee and probably other school committee members could certainly tell you more than me, um, but. When TC Passios was handed off from the uh, ownership by the schools to ownership by the town, um, there was some pushback at various levels because the building was not in good condition. Um, and I, th that is in the eye of the beholder, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just giving feedback and things that I've been told. Um, now, Turkey Hill is in a place where they're looking at saying, okay, if this remains a school, what do we need? If this is to be handed off to the town, what work would have to be done for this building to be uh, acceptable to the town? Um, in addition to this, Turkey Hill is hitting some really interesting and frustrating roadblocks um, with things like ADA. Uh, you are not going to hear me be critical of ADA personally. However, it certainly presents a challenge where once you hit a certain threshold of work on a building, you then have to bring it into full ADA compliance. Um, and while that at times might sound simple, having a large concrete <coughs> structure with load-bearing walls in various locations that can make it much more tricky to accommodate things like modern turn, like n modern required turn radiuses for wheelchairs and things like that, as one example. Um, all of that together means there is a comprehensive plan for moving Turkey Hill forward. There's hopes that there will be grants available to mitigate that. Um, exactly what that will look like is unclear because I forget the name of the state organization that normally issues grants for schools. MSBA. MSBA, thank you. Um, always has different kind of goals for how they're giving out their money. They're also changing some of their expectations and the new wording is fundamentally unclear. It used to be something like must be a school for 10 years after you use the grant. Now it is effectively, and I'm, I'm super paraphrasing, for the lifetime of the upgrade. Well, what does that mean? There are windows at Turkey Hill that are the age of the building, 50-year-old windows. Does that mean if you get a grant to replace windows at Turkey Hill that the building has to be a school for another 50 years? Um, now, the town is asking these questions. They are not getting, or to my knowledge, have not received concrete answers. And this is all things that are trying to be thought through. So there is a lot there for Turkey Hill that may or may not actually come to pass due to grants, due to anticipated future need, um, as well as this kind of an illustrative component because mayhaps, the, and this is from other conversations. I can't say this was the school committee's explicit goal. But there comes a moment you look at how many millions of dollars it takes to maintain, to keep a building, and it may end up being a more prudent fiscal choice to demolish it and go anew. But you can't really figure that unless you actually start to have a handle of what those <laughs> long-term costs will be to bring it up to the quality that's necessary. 
So that's a bit long-winded, but that is why like the Turkey Hill goes out because we may need to keep it as a school. The town may want to keep it, or we may need to know the actual cost so we can decide if it's worth keeping. Okay, I guess <clears throat> I, I guess my my point of bringing that up might have gotten lost in the weeds. I apologize. Um, I think I think our last year's total annual budget was forty million dollars for the town. I believe that was the case, something close to $40 million. Mm -hmm. So if the long-term capital plan for 10 years is saying, oh, we need $40 million, no, $20 million for schools, for two old schools, mm -hmm. that's a little ridiculous in my mind. However, um, only 4.8 of that was for Tur Tur TC Passios, and 14.8 of that was for Turkey Hill. Quite, quite. I, I'm pretty sure that Turkey Hill is is 15 to 20 years newer. Um, it, regardless, and the capital plan basically, uh, it was mentioned at the select board meeting, it was typically averaged at one and a half million per year for the last 10 years. I think. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure they gave the last, but uh, looking at the, the the 10 year forecast, one year was funding the capital plan at 13 million dollars. That's a little ridiculous. And that's why these are requests, and that's why it's this is, the numbers were given in part to help make a long term capital plan. And knowing that some of these are needs, um, the request for Turkey Hill, for example, uh, I have my own opinion about various capital plan requests that come through, right? Um, some seem more necessary for the town to function than others. To my estimation, the ones for Turkey Hill look to be unfortunately necessary. Um, like even from a, from a standpoint of how can a building continue to exist and or be legally habitable by the town. Yeah. Uh, but this accounts no additional grants, nothing else. So there's, I agree the money as it sits there doesn't look right yet. That doesn't mean it's the only way. Sure. But being a building, it is capital as well. I just wanted to make that point. No, out. thank you. Sure. Um, thank you. What type of inflation factor are they including in the uh, cost? I do not remember off the top of my head. Because it's not uncommon for communities to get the inflation exists or underestimate it and, or underestimate drastically and that's the reason I, I'm you know, 40 million of 10 years I'm actually surprised it's that low uh, okay I also know that 63% uh, of the budget last three years goes towards schools over the whole budget mm -hmm. common. Oh, yeah. yeah and that's School, I mean, it, it turns out raising the next generation of humans is costly. And, and that's the reason it's not uncommon for older municipal buildings to be spun off to private in, entities. For, I'm sorry, for what? It's not mean? uncommon for old municipal okay. buildings to be spun off to private entities. Municipal, or it's, so you're considering school buildings yeah. municipal? The, the reason being is that it's a big capital expense to upgrade them. And is a historic building, then developers that are converting it to uh, income producing can get tax credits and leverage private money with tax credits that municipal entities can't use. So it's, it's not uncommon for those older buildings to, to go that way for mm -hmm. that reason. Um, yeah, this is. Uh, Next years are going to be interesting. Uh, uh, and I don't even mean that, I don't mean that derisively. Uh, again, the, the, I think it's worth noting, just while we're talking and while members of the public hear us talking about, oh, well, this is a problem, that's a problem. They're problems. One of the pieces of feedback, and I know I've said it here before, and I'll say it again, uh, the feedback we've gotten from our plan, from our consultants working on the comprehensive plan with us, is that Lunenburg's ahead of the curve. Uh, our our 
the things the town has, our buildings, our roads, everything, are in much better condition than is typical. Now, people hear that and go, but they're not in good condition, and I'm not looking to debate whether or not they're in good condition, because that is certainly, that is not an empirical statement. We're not necessarily good, we're just less crappy than everybody else. It's just where the scale starts. Yeah, that, that the empirical thing would be, we are in a much better, somewhere between a okay and much better place than the gross majority of other communities in this state. Mm -hmm. And if you look at Lunenburg and say, but we have all these issues, I, you're not wrong, but welcome to a reckoning that is coming statewide, nationwide, mayhaps. Um, so I'm gonna move us on before I wax a little political on that one. Uh, Economic Development Committee has not met and will, I believe, be, I think we're slated to meet this Thursday, but I don't know that I have seen a uh, agenda, so I will follow up on that. But I have it on my notes that I'm supposed to make sure I can get the room unlocked, so gotta make sure we have a meeting. Stormwater Task Force. All right. Um, the the board has a direction um, finally um, it was explained in really simple terms as to what exactly the board's about because I've had all of the freestanding words but never an explanation of what it is um, and basically the idea is to create its own uh, fund for stormwater work so that the DPW can't be like we're using DPW guys sometimes they've got to go to do other DPW stuff it's just money directly dedicated to doing stormwater stuff um, we are starting to get things moving starting to find the right people to talk to um, we pulled a lot of information from uh, Concord who has uh, recently uh, went through and set up a stormwater enterprise fund um, we are having some meetings with our uh, uh, contracted engineers to see if we can't start getting what exactly is it we need to do to make this fund exist um, and we're looking to have this on the spring town meeting for 2025 is our goal well mr. Oh, and I'm the chair now mr. Wilsner <laughs> receives uh, the Matthew Brenner Award for golly am I glad to hear that news tonight <laughs> Um, I have a question on that too. Mm. Please, are you guys permanently moved to meeting at the DPW? Um, I don't think it's permanently. Um, it's just been convenient at this point in time. Okay. Um, if they're actually one other thing I was hoping to do with them is uh, kind of tap into the master plan network we've been building to get some information out there and information in. Um, at the moment we're willing to take public comment if it makes it easier for people to you know move the meetings but currently it's been working for us so we've just kept it there so if people have feelings about where the uh, stormwater task force meetings are if members of the public how should they reach out to get that information that's a good question um, I guess we um, the agenda we've got uh, zoom meetings um, mm -hmm. like everything so if they have the agenda they can jump on the zoom meeting um, or they can come down to the DPW in person um, and and uh, say whatever you know is on their mind or they think would be helpful okay great thank you uh, Montachusett regional planning I forget my C Ms. Reed help me Commission. Commission, thank you. I'm like, I know it's not committee. <laughs> um, so we haven't met since the last meeting. Our next meeting is on the 8th. Excellent. And Montachusett Joint Transportation Committee. Committee, correct. Um, we did meet, I have no notes from that meeting. It was mostly just housekeeping kind of stuff, budgeting, um, and going over projects happening in other towns. Um, so nothing really 
uh, applying to Ludenberg, um, and our next meeting is on the 14th. All right. Uh, Solar Bylaw Subcommittee. Ms. Reed and I have not had the opportunity to meet. I think, uh, Ms. Reed, would you be available over the next couple weeks for us to get together? I, so I don't know what your schedule looks like, but could we pencil in some time later over the next couple weeks to get together and start hammering out ideas? Yes, absolutely. I will say that I am going to be out of town probably the 7th of February, but I can always meet virtually or we can meet before then. I don't really have a lot going on. Okay, banger. All right, thank you. And Scenic Road Subcommittee. Um, uh, Matt and I have discussed a little bit. We haven't had any uh, proper meetings about it, um, but other towns have a lot of good uh, ideas and practices that they have in place. Um, I think I've got a list of like 12 uh, different towns and their on the books uh, scenic roads bylaws. Um, yeah, if we want, I can I can really briefly go through a couple of things that I've really liked out there. Um, I think the one Matt and I have discussed before, um, Concord has, I, I'm assuming they went through their like town historical society. Um, they've got kind of histories and descriptions of what the roads are like why what what this road is about why it's important to keep it looking nice in the way it is um that was concord uh weston had one that i really liked uh in terms of because it's it's not just the tree being there it's how the tree looks and with everything else they've also got specifications that cutting all of the branches off of a tree counts as no longer making it applicable for a scenic uh, bylaw. Like, they've got specifications on if you cut a certain number of branches over this diameter, it, it affects the, the hmm. aesthetic of the tree in the road and therefore counts as removing a tree from a scenic road. Um, Wayland had some really good plain language descriptions. I think between Wayland's plain language descriptions and Concord's historical narratives, um, there's some really good things to put out there for the public uh, before town, the town meeting be like, this is why it's important, this is why you should care about it. Um, that's the majority of what I've got. Otherwise, it's just gonna be a lot of pulling apart other towns' uh, specifications or bylaws and making them our own. Love it. Thank you, sirs. I concur. Thank you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Next up would be meeting schedule. Uh, as a reminder, the, the planning board meets at 6 o'clock p.m., and all meetings are held here at Town Hall, unless otherwise indicated. Our next two upcoming meetings are on February 12th and February 26th. And I hope to see uh, all the public wonderfully engaged as they wish. Ongoing items, master plan. I can throw out a couple more things from recent calls uh, with that team, which is um, the existing con conditions report is up. You can go to planlunenberg.org and find it. You want to know what's going on? Like basically this is the report uh, speaking to the board, but especially to members of, yes. When, when did that go up? Like within just the last couple of days? Uh, Bill and I uh, from the DPW were looking for it uh, last Thursday, and I just maybe couldn't find it. Uh, I, let me, I That's could tell you when I was told that. Give me one moment. Um, that could be in our drive too. Oh, could be. Right, because we do have a master plan. Yeah. Drive. I had this discussion on the 2nd of January. Maybe it isn't out public. Maybe it's just to us. I'll double check that. But, okay. Um, regardless, the and if you can't see it yet down, you will be able to at some point, or maybe in the finished project, but the existing conditions report, th this is what is Lunenburg now? Um, what What is here? What are the existing strengths, the existing challenges? Uh, over under reported about this at the last uh, public meeting 
and uh, the wonderful consultants kind of said, here's where we are, got more feedback from people, went back and reviewed, have spoken with the steering committee, have spoken with others to get this holistic review of where is the town now. And it's not my opinion, it's not your opinion, it's the collective opinions and just as important, the raw data to back up with facts, here's where the town is. Again, it's an opinion whether or not our municipal buildings are in good condition. It is measurable fact that they're in better condition than most other municipalities. Um, also, the, at the February 1st meeting, they will be taking a first pass at presenting potential goals to the town based off of the feedback from these surveys. If you've been taking surveys, thank you. Keep it up. There's going to be more over the next year and a half. Keep taking them. They are crucial. It's not just one, uh, because each one is different and is drilling down further. So those community, uh, that, those community meetings coming up on February 1st will deal, at least in part, with a first pass at these goals. The master plan is about where Lunenburg wants to be, and this is part of how we get there. Um, I'm looking, there's nothing else on this list that needs, that, that really is relevant for today for ongoing items. So I will turn to public comment. If there are any ghosts in the room who feel like speaking, this would be your opportunity. Seeing none. Uh, Ms. Aubrey, there's no one in the Zoom waiting room, is there? No. Nope. Okay. Um, board comment concerns? Um, I just had one. I'm going to be out of town for our next meeting, but I'll be on Zoom for it. Thank you. I have one. Um, so the uh, we, we touched upon it earlier tonight in the meeting. Um, the a and r our, our a and r submission requirements state something about board of health's input right mm -hmm. what do they state that it has to be i look at i know that and it um, has to be submitted to the board of health so it's it's not required that there's feedback from the board of health before the a and r is submitted to the planning board i'll have to check In could it could it be if it's not that way no basically under state law if somebody feels they are entitled to endorsement they can submit a plan and you can't require them to get approval from another board before they can submit the plan so i know we cannot require approval from another board right. yeah can we require because what we don't require we, we don't require that the board of health approve what they're right. doing we require that they get info from the Board of Health so that they are knowledgeable about what they're doing. I don't believe you inquire that. Okay. But as long as people don't push back on it, and so far apparently nobody's pushed back on it. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in, in conversations with Brian, the building inspector, um, he, he indicated that um, he, his understanding is we shouldn't have signed that A&R last meeting for um, the 728 Goodrich because for one it does cut the existing septic off the existing house and for two they did not have a design plan approved or submitted or I'm not sure that it's maybe submitted but my understanding was that um, his feelings were that we shouldn't have signed mm -hmm. it and that we had we had a uh, thing that frontage I think you're, you should okay. have signed it anyway um, if because it, I know from experience that if a house doesn't have septic on its property it is permissible for them to get a septic easement on another piece of property sure if in fact we did a project we had a project done where the other properties on the other side of a road and they bored under the road <laughs> For the septic tank and board of health said fine well so there's got to be something that, that there has to be something about an anr not allowing a septic system to be cut off from the existing house because that makes it non-conforming 
You cannot create non-conforming lot under zoning. Right. So regardless of the lot, I mean, the lot with the house on it is non-conforming without a septic. You, you cannot create, if, if the zoning requires the septic be on the same property, you can't create a non-conforming. Usually zoning doesn't address that. Usually zoning, usually septic is addressed mm -hmm. by Board of Health, not by zoning. So I do know that in the ANR procedure that it, it's on our website, it says that we need endorsement for Board of Health compliance prior to submitting ANR application. The applicant, if we can discuss that specific of but Goodrich Street, but if an applicant wants to challenge it and they submit an A&R without a Board of Health review and you let 21 days lapse, right. they can go to town clerk and get in, mm -hmm. get certification. I get you. Yeah. Uh, but it still wouldn't have our signatures on it. Yeah. It did end up getting that property an endorsement from Jim Graffy. Okay. I did. Just so you, I mean, it was a, there was very good miscommunication. Th that, that discussion is what prompted me to bring it up tonight. So that's very good. Thank you. And, and, and again, it, it's been, it's been, it's been decade plus that I've been complaining about the lack of communication and, and, and interaction with, with different officials and different boards and groups. And I am very extremely happy to have Brian on board. Um, I, I just the building commissioners right now that we have is is, is top notch and um, very open to having discussions. I say it's very hard to keep top notch building commissioners. Yep. So, Price kudos is. and thank you. Yeah, we are uh, lucky and grateful. All right. Any other board comments or concerns? Hearing none, I would entertain. If I could, I'd just like to update Please. the board. Please. On 7-Eleven Mass Ave, uh, we had a site visit today uh, because they've got the storm scepter in place. I'm sorry, can I interrupt? Yes. Was, was that the one that had the cease and desist on the corner there? Uh, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, that's one that had problems back in November inspection. Mm -hmm. And um, But Brian, uh, Bill, and I met with the uh, a representative of the developer is the father of one of the owners, and um, uh, their engineer and another member of the team out there, and looked at the storm scepters in place. They want to do an um, interim stormwater system, which is actually a good idea. It's, uh, I'm used to uh, applicants showing an interim construction stormwater as opposed to just the final one because usually the final one they don't want to do until they're ready to put clean runoff into it. Um, and Bill indicated from DPW indicated he's fine with what they want to do. So I instructed the engineer to give us a letter detailing the alternative, the um, uh, uh, interim measure they want to do, and then I'll send that to DPW for their review and sign off. And then we'll put on the board's agenda for uh, consideration and approval. Is that something that requires public hearing or no. is, okay. No, uh, it's, it's a de minimis change. It's basically what the, you've got a storm scepter and you don't want to be running um, a lot of dirt into it until they're ready for the final pay, the paving being done. And so they're, they're talking about doing a uh, ditch to bypass it during construction, and Bill was very satisfied with what they wanted to do. He said it makes sense, and then they would finish it. Uh, and then, before they got COs, they would have it all finished out. Okay. But that way, they'd be a managed stormwater on site, without damaging wetlands, without damaging off-site property, and without filling up the stormwater system with siltation. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Um, can I comment on that, too? Please. Um, 
So I understand the storm scepter is 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 a, a, a separator for for sediment, and it's only required for runoff, direct runoff from pavement. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, obviously it's not required until they pave. Well, under our under the decision, they had to have them done before they get a build before they get a building permit. Right, but. But also, I mean, I mean, I've been in the industry for 25 years, and and they they they're oftentimes the last thing to go in. Right. Um, are we unusual from other towns that we don't speak to that, or? I was I've been surprised not seeing construction interim construction measures on the plans, and just seeing the final. I have two, but do we require it? No, I mean. No. Mm. No. Uh, so, and they mentioned that, and Bill said, I mean, you're going to do this before you, well, that's what the town requires. And he said, and they said, well, and they, they explained what they want to do, and Bill said, that seems a good approach. And um, so I said, put in writing, let's get Bill's sign off on it, and then have the board review it. Okay, thank you. Now, is that also going to get a peer review before it comes to us? I fear if DPW signs off on it. He's not a PE. That'd and, be up to board. And he's not a peer review either. No. He's an employee of the town. I think it would behoove us to have the peer review. That, that'd be up to board side when I have peer review. Mm -hmm. um, is that something we can decide now to make the process go smoother? Yeah. Uh, if you won't have peer review of that done, yes. I, I think, yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying, Mr. Allison. I, um, to me, that makes sense. Mr. Wilsner, you're also an engineer, so I hear your thoughts as well. Um, I mean, I hear any board member's thoughts. But I'll <laughs> solicit your thoughts. Over sure. I mean, that is a pretty common um, setup in DOT work is a, a 25, a 75, a 100 percent, then a finished product um, in terms of, like, what is it that you plan on doing on your different steps and what are you doing to like keep everything in line while you're working on it so I'm totally behind that as an idea okay and, and you and you think it is a good idea for us to have a peer review of this setup yes okay great um, do we need to vote on that or I wouldn't suggest taking vote because on the agenda that's what I was thinking but we can we should have a letter from them before the next meeting and do. And what I can do is, how do you handle peer reviews? Just send it off to Graves when it comes in, or I believe so. Okay. Yeah, I send them off. Yeah, that, that's a that is something that is magically handled for okay. us. We say, is there a peer review? And then this side of the table tells us, and it's wonderful. It's either a no or a yes, and it appears. I will. <laughs> right? I will do then is when we get the uh, description in, we'll send to Graves. And say this is what they're proposing to do, and see what their response is. Yep. Can we make some kind of a, a communication without having a motion to that effect, so that we don't have to? I am understanding from the boards this is the policy that's been done, and so we'll follow the board's prior um, procedures and be sure it gets done. Great. Sounds good. Okay. Wonderful. Any other board comments or concerns? Hearing none, I would entertain uh, a motion regarding adjournment. A uh, motion to adjourn the meeting. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Ms. Reed? Aye. Mr. Wilsner? Aye. Mr. Allison? Aye. And an aye from myself. Uh, friends out in town, thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful evening, and uh, look forward to seeing you in another few weeks. Take care.